This is Thursday, February 2nd, 2012. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the ongoing Veterans Oral History Project here at the Morris Institute Library in Natick. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Louise Hale. Welcome, Louise. Hello, hello. Good morning. May I ask when and where you were born? I was born in Foxborough, Massachusetts. And when were you born? February 17th, 1919. <laughs> so you've got a birthday coming up. And what town do you currently live in? I live in Natick. And your current marital status? Divorced. Children? Two adopted children. Grandchildren? I five, I believe. All right. Now, you uh, said you were born in Foxborough? Yes. When did you move to Natick? I was about maybe, I don't, I think I must have been about two and a half mm -hmm. because the, the family moved to Natick uh, in 1922, okay. I believe. I think that's the right year. And, and why, uh, did, why did you move to Natick? Well, my mother died when we were living in Bridgewater where we lived after we lived, moved from Foxborough. And uh, I guess my father thought the family needed a change of scenery. And also he was able to get a job selling farm machinery for Fisk Corporation that was a large uh, store on Main Street in Natick at the time. And that's how we happened to come to Natick. And what was Natick like when you were growing up? <laughs> a very small uh, uh, town that probably matched many other small towns. Mm -hmm. There was nothing outstanding outside of the, they generally had a pretty good football team or something like that. But Natick wasn't an outstanding town. It was a town on the, outside of this Boston area. And people commuted from Natick to Boston, the people that worked in the city. But otherwise it just seemed to go along in this quiet pace. Mm -hmm. And where did you live in Natick during your childhood? Uh, we, when we first came to Natick, we lived in a, which is now a, a built up area, but we lived in the last house on the left hand side of Bacon Street before you go under, um, under the bridge. Mm -hmm. There was nothing between that house and the bridge on the left side of the street. On the right side, at, up on the edge of the railroad, there was a house where the man that had charge of the switch that was on the railroad, right off where the house was, and the house was there because of it, uh, and uh, he had that responsibility. Mm -hmm. But uh, I never when we never really were friendly with him. But uh, but the family lived in that house. It was an old farmhouse. It's mm -hmm. still there, the only old farmhouse on Bacon Street, and uh, it's been there. And it was owned by a Honeywell family, and, uh, and we lived there. Well, I'd say probably five years, and uh, then, uh, and in the meantime, my father remarried a woman that uh, was a Sunday school teacher at St. Paul's, and the family went to St. Paul's because we had been Episcopal. My family were Episcopalians. And when we moved to Natick, my oldest sister told my father that she would 
take a leave of absence from it. She worked at this, in the uh, payroll department at the State House in Boston. So she was on a leave of absence for a year. And so my father had to do <laughs> a lot of uh, work. Uh, so he had, he had to do his job and try and find a wife. Well, it so happened that because he was at Frisk Corporation, he met a woman who was working for the company. And at that time, it was hardware and many other things, mm -hmm. including um, kitchen furnishings and uh, anything you needed in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And she had charge of selling those things. Wow. And so he thought that was a pretty good mm -hmm. <laughs> find. And uh, so she, they were married at St. Paul's. And so she became a, my mother. And I was very young, so she really brought me up mm -hmm. because uh, she was, had, had all the problems of mm -hmm. being a stepmother. And uh, the family were pretty good. Okay. Louise, was, did you have any brothers or sisters, or were you an only child? Oh no, I had. I'm the youngest of six. Okay. I had three sisters and three brothers. Uh, two sisters and three brothers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you tell me a little more about what uh, downtown Natick was like when you were growing up? Well, downtown Natick was very. Sober. Uh, they had a, a uh, the hop, as I said, the big hardware store. Mm -hmm. and they sold anything to do with a house. But he also, they had a, uh, a a group of people who worked it, and they called it the the plumbing, plum, native plumbing and heating. And so uh, one of my brothers went to work for them and stayed with them as long as they were in business. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, and they had, as my, I said, my farm machinery. They didn't stock farm machinery, but they worked through a, a company manufacturing it and worked as a salespeople for it. Mm -hmm. And I, that's what my father did with Soul Farm Machinery. Okay. And, and you, you graduated from Natick High School? I did. In what year? 36. And what do you remember about uh, Natick during those years? Well, I can tell you one of the fixtures was a hot dog stand on the corner of Washington Street and, and uh, Main Street, mm -hmm. uh, well, not Main Street, but East Central Street. Uh -huh. And uh, in high school, if you had a dime, you could get a hot dog. Mm -hmm. And not many of us had any dimes to get hot dogs, but mm -hmm. we sure looked forward to the time when we did, could get a dime. And sometimes we were lucky, and sometimes mm -hmm. we weren't. But uh, no, everybody, uh, because you got awfully tired, as sick and tired of the sa sandwiches at the school. And if you didn't get that, you had to bring your own from home, and that was not fun. So, but uh, my uh, youngest brother went to high school here, and uh, so I kind of grew up in the. He was eight years older than I was, so. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was, and there was a couple of churches on Main Street. There's mm -hmm. the, well, there was the Catholic Church, and there was the Methodist Church right across from mm -hmm. St. Paul's. And then there was a Unitarian Church on West Central Street. And uh, uh, it was a, a pretty stayed in sober town. I, I don't think it was any, uh, there wasn't a lot of nightlife or anything like that. It's pretty quiet. Okay. 
Now, while you were in high school, uh, did you were uh, were you um, did you keep up with current events, especially what was happening in Europe at that time? Well, I was out of school. I out of school by the time uh, the 30, 30s. I graduated in thirty six. Mm -hmm. well, uh, like the of rise it. of the Nazi Party and stuff like that. What the rise of the Nazi Party, the fascists, what was going on in Japan. Was that talked about when you were in high school? No, you see, that was pretty much after. Mm -hmm. And um, no, uh, I think uh, I, I went. To, I went graduated from high school, and I went for a year at a secretarial school in Boston. And uh, and then I I went to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I worked for Holsa Cabot, the elect Holsa Cabot Electric Company was the name, and what they manufactured telephone systems, and uh, and uh, telephone and um, let's see, other one good um, telephone systems and. Uh, well, uh, communication systems mm -hmm. within a building, too, right. which was fairly new in that time. Mm -hmm. So now you're working as a secretary? I was working as in, a secretary in, in, the, in their engineering department. Okay. And tell us what happened on December 7th, 1941. What was your family doing? Oh, 41. Uh, well, I was I was living at home with my family, and at that point we were living on Kinsman Place, mm -hmm. and as I remember it, uh, when the act, that's when we started hearing all the activity, mm -hmm. but um, it didn't. Quite register with with us because um, well my brothers were old enough so uh, the the older two were old enough so they wouldn't be in the service and the other one had had um, uh, asthma and uh, wasn't. Uh, couldn't to uh, wouldn't be called, so the, it didn't register as too bad that you know you didn't really think. But uh, when when the soldiers was beginning to pick, they were beginning to recruit for G Germany. Uh, then it began to sink in, and people realized that this is this is really going to happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, so at that point, everybody was pretty charged up and you know, thinking lots of things that could could happen, and mm -hmm. and uh, so that uh, by the time. They started recruiting for Germany. Uh, people were more than ever afraid, and and when on 41, when the uh, attack to Pearl Harbor, I was uh, at my boyfriend's house for dinner, and this is before dinner, and he was up in the attic pulling out some Christmas decorations, and I was standing down here to catch them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, when they announced it over the radio, that he had the radio going to listening to some music, and they cut in. And we just stood there and looked at the radio and couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, of course, 
and all came to fire, and everybody was having jitters and you know, on top of the mm -hmm. ones who were going to Germany. So it was uh, pretty, uh, pretty scary. Mm -hmm. And uh, when things had, you know, really been quiet, and and we sort of hadn't thought about. The Pacific, as far as war is concerned, mm -hmm. it was the last thing you think of, and uh, because uh, they all seemed to be so into themselves, and mm -hmm. uh, so it uh, didn't register. Mm -hmm. Tell us what happened after war was declared. Did you continue to work in Boston? Yes, but I'd, I had a different job. I had left on my own volition Holsa Cabot because the plant was a very nice brick building, but it was in Roxbury. Mm -hmm. In order for me to get to it by train, I had to go into the South Station and then go up to the stairs to the elevated and spend about a half an hour on the elevated getting to Eggleston Square Station where I got off, and I had to walk, oh, well, two or three blocks, no, one, about five blocks, mm -hmm. to the building. So it was a, it was a chore, and I had, to, I was supposed to be there at eight o'clock in the morning. There was no way I could make it, mm -hmm. and getting the twenty minutes to seven train, and get there. And so they gave me permission to get there at 8.30, mm. <laughs> which was big hearted of them, but I guess they wanted to keep me. And anyway, uh, uh, so that was how I, I uh, but everybody was talking all, all war, Germany war and in the Pacific and everything. And so well, there was a lot of talk about it. Okay. And your husband-to-be, what happened to him? Well, when I, when he got drafted, mm -hmm. he, uh, yeah. but I wasn't married when I was in working at Holzer Cabot. Mm -hmm. I was before that. Okay. We got married in uh, 42, isn't it? Uh, I got married in September. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think it was 40, was it 41? Is it, I don't know. Well, according to your notes, um, your husband was drafted in the fall of 42? All right, then we were married mm -hmm. in 42. Okay. He was drafted after we got married. Mm -hmm. And yes, that would be s September of 42. And he was drafted and he left Natick, I think it was, um, in early December, a whole, a whole bunch of them were grafted from Native. And, and what service did he go into? He went in the Army. The Army, okay. And what did he do when he was in the Army? Well, he, he was stationed, after he was grafted, he was stationed down in Connecticut at some, I think it was like a receiving station mm -hmm. for them where they sorted out where they thought they should go and all that type of thing. And he was there, oh, about a month or so. Mm -hmm. And I know he had wanted me to come down. And I went down and got off the train at, uh, oh, uh, the station just before New York City. Mm -hmm and uh, Connecticut, <laughs> and we walked the streets of the town and uh, of excitement. And then I turned around and got the pain back to Boston that night. But um, then he was switched to um, a, a uh, camp in just over the New, York's, New Jersey line in was in New York, mm -hmm. and it was, do you remember the name of the camp? 
this, my memory is not great. So you'll have to bear with That's me on good. that. But before but, we proceed, uh, can you give me your husband's name? <laughs> His name? Mm -hmm. At that time, mm -hmm. this will come to you later, but that time was Hale Herrero, H-E-R-R-E-R-O. Okay. His name's down on the on, on, okay. down there. That was his maiden, that was the name he was. Uh, and um, to, do you want me to want to say on, on that? He, when my, uh, my father, he was trying to find a job when he got, um, when he would, before he was drafted, you see. Mm -hmm. And so he, uh, my, fa my father sent him to a lawyer he knew in Marlboro. And I don't know anything about the lawyer, but he advised him to change his name. He said, you'll never get a decent job in New England with that name. And this was the theory they had in those days, apparently. And so he did, much to his mother's dislike. But anyway, he went through the formal formality. And so, uh, because I had, it affected me too. So uh, anyway, we, we did it. And it, he changed his name to Edward Ledwidge Hale. Okay. So he's down uh, somewhere in a camp in New York and New Jersey. Uh, what were you doing at the time? Well, he was wanted me. Well, after he got to, it's Camp Shanks was the camp. The uh, well, they didn't have. Um, he wanted me to go down there. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Not, he didn't mean to the camp. He said, I'll find a, a good place and we can rent a room mm -hmm. and you can commute to New York. It's very simple, he said. Because, of course, he wasn't doing it. And uh, so, well, I thought about it. So I gave up my job. And I went down there, and the only reason I went as willingly as I did was because my sister and I were friends with Hope, a woman, Hope Dimmock, mm -hmm. that lived in Natick, and she went to the uh, went to the. She had been to the same secretarial school that I had been to in Boston, mm -hmm. which Pierce Secretarial is no longer there. And it was on Boylston Street. And uh, so uh, she was working in New York. And my sister Peg used to communicate with her, letters and notes and stuff. And so Peg said something about, I was thinking of going to New York and getting a job and commuting, commuting to Englewood, New Jersey. And so uh, she said to Hope, any, any, think you, can you think of any place she should go to look for a job? Hope said, tell her to come where I am. And so Peg said, well, where, where are you? Because Hope hadn't told her. So she gave her the name of, mm -hmm. of um, the uh, place to the place to go to, you know, And so, because I didn't know anything about this, so Peg was telling me this, and she said, "Well, you really ought to have. I mean, you'd have an in. She, she you know, she's working there, and you." Uh, she must know whether they're hiring, and, and she wouldn't tell you. And so she said, why don't you go down and see? You can always say no and mm -hmm. come back. So anyway, I did. 
and she'd give me directions on how to get there. Well, I was in Englewood, New Jersey, in a rooming house with several other people, and uh, right on the right on the main drag of Engel Street, which was directly no south of mm -hmm. the road, that road went directly to Camp Shanks. <laughs> but I had to go to, into New York. Well, I had to take a bus from where on that, that street over to, to, the, to the bridge, George Washington Bridge. And then the bu if, if I had a through bus <laughs> to the city, I, they'd take you across the bus. If you didn't, you had to get another bus to get across. <laughs> but anyway, get on in the kitchen. What you had to do was get on the 8th Avenue subway and go south forever <laughs> down to the lower part of New York City. Mm -hmm. And you get down, way down where the <laughs> The produce comes in off the water and everything, and uh, and the, it's a long, long hard ride. Mm -hmm. And the wet in summer it's pitiful. Well, anyway, uh, so I went, and Peg, uh, Hope got the interviewed, mm -hmm. and uh, they liked that I was the secretary. And that, that I that Hope Dimmick recommended her, and so he, and so uh, took me a week to so. But in the week, I was there. Mm -hmm. I ha I had to report every day. I didn't have anything to do, but I had to report every day. Well, to sp spend eight hours doing nothing. Is pretty <laughs> bad, mm -hmm. so I used to pick up the magazines and try and get a, get a find a book if I can bring or something. But anyway, well then after a week, I finally got hired. And in the meantime, I heard from Natick, my sister, that she said, you know, somebody talk to all the neighbors around here about you. And I said, well, why would they do that? And she said, I don't know. Somebody came and asked them. And they, they said you were a good kid and, you know, ni nice girl. You know. mm -hmm. So she said, they said the right thing. <laughs> but they didn't know who they were talking to. Mm -hmm. Can't imagine anybody talking like that. Any, they did. Well, that was it. Well, I got hired. So I started, and I went to work. Well, I finally started to have something to do with my days, which was a godsend. And it was with an engineer who was working on loan from his, his company for the duration, mm -hmm. and I was doing some secretarial work for him because the man I was supposed to be working for was out of town on business. It's business, it was not, well, that was it. Yeah. And uh, so, all right, so I'll meet him later. Well, he would get back in about 10 days, and he was, well, a very serious, I mean serious, gentleman. And his, he, was, uh, he was the manager of the pump department, which was where I was working. He was by. Uh, he is on loan from the federal government, from Standard Oil of Indiana. He was their 
managed, he was general manager of the facility in uh, Illinois. And he was a physicist. And you haven't lived until you've tried to take dictation from a man who didn't want any discrepancy in the understanding of what he, was, what he said. And he made that very clear to me mm -hmm. and did nothing for my nervous system. <laughs> and uh, but we, we got along all right. I had certain duties that kind of, <laughs> well, it didn't floor me, but I, uh, it was quite unusual. Mm -hmm. He asked me, he had a water, um, it wasn't a jug, it was a glorified pitch, pitcher, but it was uh, on his desk. And he, he said, uh, he, this was when I was Mrs. Herrero, um, he, he asked, asked me uh, to take the pitcher and fill it each morning and have it on the desk waiting for him. And I said, well, fill, what do you want me to fill, have it filled with? I thought he went from, the, from a, a restaurant or something. And he said, oh, any water, any old water faucet. So I, I said, well, I can't use the one in the ladies' room because I can't get that. And then he said, well, you'll have to find some other place to get it. And I was pretty new there, and I, so I got hold of one of the other girls, and I told her, she said, well, I think there's a faucet down, down the corridor ways, and see if you can use it. Because it couldn't be cold water, and it couldn't be hot. It had to be tepid. Mm -hmm. And he, oh, he was vigilant. Well, I thought it was strange, but then I realized he had an ulcer, and that was the reason. Well, then I could understand if he had said that first. But anyway, anyway so I got the one, so that made him happy. Louise, and, uh, uh, let's, uh, if I could interrupt for a moment. Mm. Uh, at any time while you were working, especially during the first day, were you aware of what, uh, what your employers were doing? No, I, I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, I learned through, by, from one of the engineers mm -hmm. because he knew, you know, that uh, he would, Mr. Mr. Watts wouldn't have told me. And uh, so he said, you really should know. He said, we'll, we're building a building. And it's going to have all, all new pipes and um, for all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And he said, he's going to be make, doing some trips and he said, we all may, one or other. By that time, I had met the man who I was talking with then. He, was, he lived in, in New Jersey, and he was on loan from, um, from the uh, company next door, mm -hmm. across the street. The, of, the office where he was was in the... Uh, the name of the building. Mm -hmm. uh, Deb can... Oh, that's okay. But well, were you aware that you were being, you were the secretary for what became known as the Manhattan Project? The building oh, of yes. the atomic bomb? Oh, well, Manhattan mm -hmm. Project, yes. Mm -hmm. But nothing other than that. 
and we had, of course, had badges, yes. and we uh, the the girls had to had to have the badge. And we most of us wore suits mm -hmm. or at least a jacket with a pallet, a, a pallet that you could because we had to hide to hide the badges. Mm -hmm. You you didn't wear the badges even down to the restaurant downstairs to mm -hmm. eat. Um, you uh, not not to wear it outside of the office, and the office was that we were in was on the eighth floor of the building, and then on the ninth floor, army the army had a, that floor, and so we on eat on that floor or this the one we were on was the only place we should let the badge be shown. So okay. while um, while you were working here, um, how long did you work on the Manhattan Project as a secretary? Uh, I worked, I think, about a year and a half, if I remember correctly. And while you were working in on the Manhattan Project, uh, did you receive uh, letters from your family or your husband? Yes, at, at home. Okay. Mm -hmm. At home. And in the in the room I had. Good I, it old was a nice, house. It was a nice house. It was a nice old house. But and a terrible we, commute. What? A terrible commute. Well, it it wasn't the it wasn't hard. Mm -hmm. It was just so long. Yes. And in those days, on the on public transportation, mm -hmm. there was nothing. There were, there was no, no air conditioning, of course, mm -hmm. and and on Eighth Avenue, you went through whole series. You start downtown in the lower Manhattan, and some people come in, get on, you know. Well, then you get up around Forty Second Street, and a lot of commuters start getting on from the, all the stores and restaurants and everything in mid in Manhattan. He got in on about 120, uh, 125th Street. And he went, I was going to 100, and, out of 150, I was going to, out of 175, I was going to 150th Street, get off there to go back over the bridge. Well, I just about made it, I'll tell you. Oh, it, was, it was, and I got home, but I couldn't eat a thing. Mm -hmm. And my husband had had the day off, and so he had, we had a cooking facility in this room. Mm -hmm. And so he had put something together and gone a little shopping and got some stuff. <laughs> I couldn't eat a thing. Oh, dear. So, anyway, uh, but, uh, Oh, it was a it was an adventure, I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. it, uh, now, what was your husband doing um, at the time? At the time, he was what they called, um, well, the, it, it, we, we were getting ready for the Germany push, mm -hmm. and it was an embarkation point. They they had to go through Shanks in order to get to the boat boats mm -hmm. and uh, so he was he was an ins inspecting guns that's what he said and um, he did he got to know quite a lot about guns mm -hmm. so that was okay and I understand he eventually was sent overseas well yes in a roundabout way mm -hmm. He, um, he was, he thought when he got to Shanks that he was going to be there forever, you know, but it turned out uh, about a year and a half, I think, after he was there, they made some changes countrywide, apparently, and he and a lot of them were shipped to Fort Hood in Texas. 
or no Fort Hood. And so at that point, uh, I had had it, I really, living like that. And uh, not, the job wasn't that bad. It was, was the commuting and mm -hmm. living in a room. And I just wasn't used to it. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, I'm going to go back to Vedic and go back in the bus. And unfortunately, <laughs> the man I worked for in Holzer, um, in, in, uh, my job before I got married, mm -hmm. um, he was, uh, it was a, um, a, cl a club that people that had anything to do with transportation were involved in. And at the time, my boss uh, was in charge of transportation of, um, of uh, skins from South America to Swift and Company, um, and they all came into Boston, and he was in charge of getting those ships and receiving the ships, that kind of thing. And so he knew anybody in traffic, and so he would just call it, call it, uh, when he went to a meeting, he'd say, do you know any, any secretarial openings, or do you have any? And they'd say yes or no and so So that's how I got to two of my jobs. Mm -hmm. I got the job um, that I got, that I, uh, when I had one in the service, I went to, to work right away. Mm -hmm. And I had left the job, the other one, because uh, I, I just wanted to. And uh, so I got another job. And, Canadian National Railways Pay Traffic Office mm -hmm. in, on, uh, on Federal Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, and then I went to New York, uh, I uh, went to New York, mm -hmm. and uh, so when I came back, I w went and uh, saw him again. Mm -hmm. And he got me the, into San, uh, Santa Fe Railway. Mm -hmm. And Santa Fe Railway had a freight traffic office on Boston Street in the little building. So I went there, and <laughs> I wasn't secretarial, but I was the eastbound tracing clerk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it knew, drew nothing of me. I had any idea what I was doing. But I soon learned. Mm -hmm. And what it is, is railroads, and I suppose they still do it, but if they have uh, perishable goods, they operate by trans. They they stop at certain points along the line and re-ice. Now it's all, of course, electrical, electrical, and much simpler and more efficient. But in those days, Santa Fe Railway began started out in California, okay. or any other western, southwestern. States, and it would come across and up to Wichita, Kansas, and St. Louis, and up to Chicago, and then they would in Chicago, if they come to Boston, they Boston Railroad, and in those days, Boston uh, 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 would they pick the they would pick uh, up these these cars, and it was an you know, it was a business exchange. Mm -hmm. you, they signed on and they signed off, you know. And so uh, that's what I was checking on. And also you, you work with people that are working and the, the, um, there was a lot more of that kind of thing mm -hmm. than there is now. Now so much of it's air freight and mm -hmm air shipping and but everything either went over the rail or went mm -hmm. and went someplace and uh, so uh, in Boston is a, was a fairly big was a much bigger business than, than it is now I think mm -hmm. in the respect of railroads and transportation 
So now you're working back in Boston, you're living back in Natick. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what Natick was like during the war. Well, it was pretty subdued and uh, people, you know, they, um, they, weren't, they weren't quite sure. Now that we had two fronts going, you know, and twice as many people and it was, it was a scary time, really. Right. But everybody kept their heads on. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I understand you knew uh, the Little Brothers, two of whom died during the war. Well, I was in, one of them was in my class in school. Uh -huh. I'm not sure what he was, I can't remember what he, there was one of, I don't think he was. Mm -hmm. he, had a, like, he had like five or six brothers. Mm -hmm. All the family was all boys. Right. And, it, and they were nice kids. They were all nice people. They were Swedish, and uh, they lived in East Natick. And uh, they, it, was, uh, it was a crime because the poor woman, I don't know how she ever survived, but uh, it was a pretty tense one time, especially for people who had anybody in the service. And, uh, but Ed, when he, he went to, you know, to uh, Fort Hood in Texas, mm -hmm. and then he, they came up to uh, up the coast to, in one of the, I think it was one of the Carolinas. He was there for a while. And then I didn't hear from him for quite a while. And I finally heard. Guess where he was? Where in, was he? In Greenland. What was he doing in Greenland? He was in Greenland, he says, with a bunch of nut nutty guys, and we don't know what the hell we're doing here, <laughs> but we're here. And they were there, you know. The stories he had to tell weren't very nice for printing, but mm. <laughs> they, they were funny. But, uh, you know, he was there for about I don't know, I think it was about nine months or so. Mm -hmm. And then he finally <laughs> came back to uh, Devon's and <laughs> got discharged. So uh, Tell us a little bit about the end of the war, especially what was happening with when the atomic bomb was dropped. Oh, where was I? What year was that? That would have been 1945, 45. in August. Yeah, 45. I was in, I was in Natick, I think. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, you know, because I had to give up the job at Santa Fe Railway, mm -hmm. I had to write everything, record everything I, ha I did. And I, I had written shorthand for years, mm -hmm. but to do everything in long hand, I had to, rec because you see, they only had a teletype machine. And that teletype came, would issue the information on the cars traveling from, say, Chicago to Boston. And yeah, I had to keep all those separate, keep them separate. The ones that were coming to Boston, some were going to New Haven, Connecticut, they, you know, they're going all over the lot. But, and it all had to be done in longhand then. You could communicate with another office by teletype, but the records of the trains all had to be. And for instance, one morning I went into work at eight o'clock all by myself because they let me, <laughs> they wanted me to be in there at eight o'clock in the morning. So I used to work from eight to three and they gave me Wednesday afternoon off. <laughs> And to compensate, so that was the way. But that's what I did for all, of, for all during the, during the really the busy part. 
and there were thousands of trains moving. And so I, ha I had to follow all, this, all the Santa Fe trains. And they were all going different places, but I mean, I had to follow the ones that were coming east. As far as, they got, well, they, if they went to Chicago, it was Boston and New York. That, so that was one of my trains. But you had to sort out mm -hmm. what, you know, what, generally speaking, they were pretty good at getting the right trains in the right area, but uh, information-wise. So. Uh, let's, uh, let's focus on August 1945, when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. What were your feelings about that? I mean, you were working at the Manhattan Project, which produced yeah. the atomic bomb. Oh, no. yes, but I wasn't there then. Mm -hmm. uh, it's long, it was long before well, that. When, when you like read in the paper or watched it on the newsreel, what was your reaction? The only thing I can remember when I was working at the Manhattan Project in New York and living in New Jersey, I was, had the radio on for the, the news and the weather, and they bought it in on it. Mm -hmm. And I think it was Arthur Godfrey, if I'm not mistaken. He says, oh my God, they bombed, they, you know, they, um, they bombed. And, uh, And I can, I, and then everybody was, ooh, everybody's mouth was going like this. No matter where you were, they were everybody was just very excited. Mm -hmm. And okay, so tell us what happened after the war ended. Uh, husband's back from Greenland. Uh, did you stay in Natick? Well, uh, I may get let's say no. I. I had to give up Santa, Santa Fe, yeah, mm -hmm. and so uh, Pops, my father said, uh, there, to, there has to be a secretarial job someplace in Natick. And I said, well, it doesn't have to be secretarial. I said, I'd just like to, I'm try, tired of commuting and kind of stuff. So uh, anyway, uh, Ed's mother, Irene Herro, was nurse at the, the hospital. Mm -hmm. And so she said, uh, we, why don't you call, uh, call do, uh, Dr. Lavelle? Because I heard her uh, uh, friends leaving, and uh, she was the, did the, you know, did her books and stuff. And uh, she said, uh, I'm sure you can do that job, she's done. And so, anyway, so I did, and then Irene did too. So between the two of them, I, I got the job. Mm -hmm. And I was there for you know, a couple of years. And uh, Ed got out in the meantime, and I can remember she, she gave me the afternoon off so I could meet him at the Parker House in Boston. And that's where he was, we, that was where he was wanted to go. And uh, so anyway, uh, that's what I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, but I, I was delayed from greeting him at the door of the room because I was down getting uh, tickets for <laughs> tickets <laughs> for for she and her husband mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, anyway I got her, I got her tickets and, mm -hmm. and then uh, got it and uh, that was that was it mm -hmm. but uh, of course we didn't have any place to live or anything so we were back at my my parents' house, my sister's husband um, was, he, oh, let's see, 
I'm just, he got, well, he, he was, uh, I think he was back about the same time, but when, it was fairly close. He was a, a medic in the army in Germany, and he, he had seen an awful lot. And, um, but uh, uh, so anyway, that was it. So. I don't know whether that's what you want. Or <laughs> well, um, Louise, is there anything else you would like to add? Uh, any uh, message you'd like to give to those who are going to be watching this in the future? <laughs> that's what I'm afraid of. It's kind of gibberish, really. Um, well, it's a, it's a growing, it's a growing, phase. all I can suggest is that uh, it's an, it's an education in itself, if growing up mm -hmm. in that time. I mean, I was a little innocent kid, mm -hmm. and I was the youngest in the family, and Lord, I never saw any anything destructive or people be, being anything but nice. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't, you don't get that in Sunday school and you don't get it in day school, mm -hmm. but you know, nor even in high school. Then it was pretty, pretty, everything was pretty decent. I mean, nobody had any money, mm -hmm. but still uh, you didn't, didn't think you did. Mm -hmm. Your parents somehow got around it so that you, I mean, it took a lot of planning in those days to, right. to bring up a family and, mm -hmm. and uh, situations as it was. I remember my, my father used to get meat from a, a small meat market over near where the post office is now. He may, I don't know where it's even there though. And, uh, and he, he'd come home one night and he said, I got lucky today. And Mother said, what, what happened? He says, I got half a pound of Hamburg. And boy, we had Hamburg that night, four of us. Mm -hmm. We had a half a pound of Hamburg. Now, kids today, <laughs> That doesn't just a good sized sandwich, you know. And I mean, they haven't experienced anything shortage. And I can remember working in New York, I had a ticket and I wanted, it was, I could get a pair of shoes and I needed a pair of shoes. Well, I got it, I had that ticket. And I almost wore the ticket out carrying it around because I wanted to make sure I got what I wanted and could fit me and you know, and all that good thing. And I can't tell you how many stores I went on, all the shops on so-called Fifth Avenue. Well, well, of course I had to take into charge how much money I had and I'd been save, saving, mm -hmm. because I know I only have one pair a year. And I, I did a lot of walking, believe it or not, in New York, mm -hmm. because you walked to go any place to get some lunch, you had to walk, because nobody had money enough to go talk in a taxi, like, or the taxis weren't that busy. Mm -hmm. And you didn't, uh, spend any money except to eat mm -hmm. and to get where you have to go to work. And so you could save some money. And that's what I did. And, uh, and I, saved, I saved war bonds mm -hmm. during the war. I bought a bond every month, as long, every day, every time, I, wherever I worked. I, and it taught me a lot because 
we moved, we, Ed and I moved to Canada to 20, when, after we went to work for New Holland, and they moved us around. Mm -hmm. And that's an education, but that's got nothing to do with this. But I think it helped me grow in a way that I wouldn't have been able to uh, if I'd stayed in Natick. Mm -hmm. I think you need to get out in the world and before you settle down, not after. I think it's because it's hard moving around with a family. I know I had it because uh, Ed's work moved, moved us around. And we started out in Pennsylvania and then they, that was where he was in training. And then they gave him a territory of New, um, New Hampshire and part of Vermont. And then we got transferred to Tennessee. You start all over again, new environment. Mm. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's growing. I mean, I, I, I didn't hate it, mm -hmm. but it wasn't home. Right. But it was different, and it had some good points and uh, some bad points. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, I think you, I think it's uh, good to uh, over uh, when you're young and have, don't have any attachments. But when you're married with children, it's harder. Right. Well, looking back on what you did during the war years, do you think that you made a valued contribution to the war effort? I hope I did because I have never written, typed such technical stuff in my life. <laughs> and I, talk, I worked for engineers, electrical engineers, and just plain engineers. Mm -hmm. But, ah, oh, that man, he was a brilliant man. Mm -hmm. And I didn't tell you the funny thing. Tell us now. Tell you now. Well, I had been working there probably three or four weeks. And I began to get twinges in my side. Mm -hmm. And I knew I, what it was. It was in my appendix. But I kind of forgot about it, you know, or made myself forget about it. Well, one morning I got up and, oh, I was in pain, real pain. And I didn't know, I'm down there in New Jersey. I didn't know a soul. I didn't know any doctors or anything. But I knew I had to go to a doctor. So I got the telephone book and I picked out a name and I went. And Fortunately, I've got a very nice man. And so he, I told him my story. And I think he knew pretty much what it was, it was but I, he says, I want to do is give you some tests first. And so he gave me tests, rods and stuff, and drew blood and the whole nine. And he said, young lady, you get yourself to the nearest hospital and stay there. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you are in danger of dying if you don't get to the hospital this day. And I said, well, I'm not, I'm not I don't even know a hospital, any hospital, and you're the first man doctor that I've seen. He said, trust me, you need surgery. Well, right about then I thought, oh God. I said, well, would it be all right if I got back to my hometown in Massachusetts? Can you do it today, right now? I can start working on it right now, yes. So I called Ed at Camp Shanks and Somehow I got to speak with him. 
don't ask me what went through, do, 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 this real army stuff. And so he got on and said, what, he said, What's, what the heck is wrong? And I told him. He says, oh my God. He said, I'll try and get a leave and, I, and, and I'll call mom and tell her you're coming and to be ready. And so I said, okay. I agreed with anything. And so then I went home and I laid down, I remember, on the bed. But I didn't dare do anything else but stay quiet for a while. So I did. And Ed got home. And we threw stuff in the bag and I, we went. And we drove. And it's a long ride when you're... I was in real pain then, too, and uh, it was an awful long ride home. I got home, and uh, we went to my folks' house, and uh, up, they were up on North Main Street then. And uh, so, uh, and then as soon as I saw the folks, I, they took me up to the hospital, and his mother had practically entered me and, and everything. So I just went straight straight to the operating room. I mean, there wasn't any delay. She had made it all mm -hmm. very simple. So anyway, I did. And boy, I was, I, I was sick. Afterwards, too, it was miserable. Because uh, I, uh, my blood was, mm -hmm. and so, and uh, it was, it was kind of scary, but Got through it all right. Mm -hmm. Lived. <laughs> I hope the boss understood. <laughs> what? Your boss. Oh, well, I didn't get to back until about it was over two weeks, mm -hmm. and because uh, I had to clear get cleared because I I didn't dare get down there mm -hmm. by my and be by myself and, and uh, nothing else. So anyway, I I finally got back. And he was very happy to see me. But the funny thing, the whole thing, was I had the operation the minute it was Dr. Stone in Southboro. They got hold of him, and he was waiting for me at the, at the hospital when I got there. And so uh, anyway, uh, but uh, he... Uh, It was, and so I, my, the first day I was really not with it at all, and then the second day it was a little better, but I hadn't been up, up on my feet mm -hmm. or anything. And uh, the nurse came to me and she said, who do you work for in New York? And I said, well, I work on the Manhattan Project. And she said, well, I don't know but who it is, but he's driving us nuts. I said, what's the matter? She said, he wants you to come to the phone. Of course, he thought I had a phone in the bedroom. Well, of course, I didn't uh, in those days and need it. And so he said, so I said, oh, they said, We've got to get you up, and it's, it's cannot, I know you're not going to be happy. And boy, I wasn't happy a bit. But anyway, I got on the phone, and I said, Mr. Watts, what is it you didn't want? He said, I need to know where my, my expense folder is. I said, Mr. Watts, you know the file right in the corner? near the door, and your name is on the third drawer down. I said, that's your file where your expenses are. Oh, okay, all right, hung up, and I'm through. <laughs> oh, God, typical, you know. Oh, and all that, by the time I got back in the bed, I didn't care if it was school kept or not. Oh, gee. Oh, I think we'll end it here. But Louise Hale, thank you so much for <laughs> coming in and taking part in the Veterans Oral History Project. Oh, well, I hope it makes some impression on mm -hmm. somebody, but it's just, um, it's, it 
made me remember a lot of things I had forgotten, I'll tell you.